No, this is part. This is an unclassified um, convite uh, from Northwest Africa. Tom, uh, Tom can't be here tonight, and he didn't leave me his gavel, so I thought it would be appropriate to bring a meteorite to start the meeting. So there's that. Um, of course, you know me. I'm Rich Nugent, and welcome to the uh, 915th meeting of the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston. Founded in 1934. Uh, and uh, joined forces with the uh, Bond Astronomical Society in 1973. We are most likely the largest and oldest, or one of the largest and oldest astronomy clubs in the United States. So I'd like to welcome everybody tonight. We have a, a, a action packed, jam packed uh, meeting tonight with Stella Kafka as our guest speaker a little bit later on. So I think the system is working. Everything seems to be in order. So let's begin. So, we'll start with the secretary report. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and Mario Mata. I'm not going to get heckled. It's going to pass on you. Okay, a couple of things going on. First of all, uh, I was at the uh, North Shore Club last Friday giving a talk, and we did go out to look at uh, Mars and uh, Neptune and. They were already pretty widely separated. It wasn't as spectacular as I would have liked because there were two stars right next to Mars that were closer to Mars than Neptune was, so it kind of took away. But it's still something that's not going to happen, I guess, for another 200 years before they're that close to get that together again. Two meteor showers are the main things we're going to be seeing between now and uh, the next time the club meets. And uh, both of them are very favorable as far as the moon phase. First one, in fact, is happening as we speak, and I don't know if it's going to stay cloudy or if we're going to get some clear skies, but the uh, uh, the Geminid meteors, which is probably the most uh, uh, favorable of all meteor showers, uh, it's going to happen uh, a little after midnight tonight. In fact, if you get home, Gemini should already be a little above the horizon, but you won't see the meteors radiating below. But by about 2 o'clock, Gemini will be well, you'll be able to catch as many meteors as you can, and typically you'll get uh, 50 to 100 in an hour. So I'd say definitely just take a look, give it some time, and see what you see when you get home if the skies do clear. Later on, the evening of January 3rd to 4th, we have another meteor shower, which is also pretty rich, but the peak is very short. It's only a few hours that you get really peak activity. That's the uh, quadrantid meteors, named after non-existent constellations. It's near kind of the junction of Boudis and the Big Dipper. And uh, again, you can see anywhere from 50 to 100 meteors. The peak time is going to be about, I think I've heard, 9 o'clock in the evening, our time. So it's not going to be really well seen at that particular time. UT. Still, what's that? 20 UT, according to this. Uh oh, I had two UT and another, but that was Sky and Telescope. So oh, Kelly, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad when he's here. You know. <laughs> but anyway, there's your two shots right there. There were, as far as the planets go, uh, Mercury's going to have a somewhat favorable morning apparition, and the Venus, of course, reaches greatest elongation in the morning sky. So those things are coming up as well. I'll go on the next slide. Comet Wharton, and there's been a lot of buzz on the, the website, of course, about this. And has anybody seen it naked eye yet? No. Naked no. Eye. How about binoculars? It's, it's, going, it's right now. It's going through Taurus. These didn't come out all that clear, but this is these are some of the legs of Taurus. It's today's it's the the astronomy chart. <laughs> Does it say it's too bad? Seriously, I don't know. Anyway, for the next week or so, it's be going through Taurus, and then it'll move on toward Auriga. So uh, that's a good bet for uh, binoculars if you haven't had a chance to see it. Next, that's a, a large diffuse comet. It's um, it's yeah, it's, it's really big, and the moon is now kept getting to where it's going to be a bit offensive. So. Um, get those observations in December 16th. Soon. Obviously, it'll be yeah. right next to the Pleiades. Yep. Unfortunately, the way the prospects are not. Right. 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 But I always get mixed up by these. This would actually be the evening of the 15th, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's area <laughs> too. So the evening of the 15th. So this is the, it'll be right about here at this particular point, somewhere and just heading toward the Pleiades. Okay. All right, and the last slide. Okay, the observer's challenge. Uh, I, Send a picture to Roger Iverson. He's the one that, of course, is behind a lot of this, and he lives in North Carolina. You know what the weather's been like there. So I took a picture of my front lawn and emailed it to him and said, could you send up your lawnmower? My grass is getting too tall. <laughs> and I told him I'd send him a snowblower just in exchange. So. But anyway, the, the uh, object that they're using for December is NGC 1003. It's a spiral galaxy in Perseus. 
And I tried for it and didn't have any luck with a 10 inch scope, but I have magnitude five skies, so you're gonna need some reasonably dark skies. And some of you have already seen this galaxy though, right? We were at, uh, at the clubhouse, uh, was it last week, Steve? Uh, we started here at 18 inch. Yeah. It was kind of pretty, it was nice. I tried my 20 inch from uh, Framingham on Monday night. I could, I could just, uh, if I had known it was there, I, I, you would have seen it. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty faint. But that's okay, it's not, you should still give it a shot. But you know what? There's this thing called serendipity. I did have a negative obs observation, but I did star hopping. I went to Algol and I worked for a couple of stars here to the star 12 per year right here, which is on one of my finder charts, and I star hopped from 12 to the galaxy. Well, I was focusing on 12. It shows you it's a wide double star, wide pair, and I couldn't get the focus to work. The, the main star looked okay, but the, the fainter star just looked kind of blurry and fuzzy. I couldn't remember what's going on. I'm focusing. I said, wait, it looks like two stars. No, it can't be. But then this thing settled. It was a double star, a very close pair. So this star right here is actually a double star. It's one of the Struva pairs. I forget the number. It's in the 900s. Uh, but it's about 7.5 and 8.5 and magnitude, about 20 arc seconds, something like that. It just was a beautiful sight in that 10-inch scope. So if you star hop and you're happy to key on that, just check out that extra star. It's a nice little double star. And then we're toward 1003. We also, uh, Rogers also, with Sue French's help, set up a, um, the, 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 whole, the whole roster of all these uh, observers challenges from now through the year 2011. Or 20, yeah, it's already 20, 2021. <laughs> so uh, if you get a chance, look on the LVAS site and you can plan ahead. He's already listed the ones, the next January ones for the next three years. Sure. Okay. The, the other thing to say about this chart right here is um, um, I, I keyed off of M34 and, and 12. Uh, j just adjacent to uh, 1003, it's just off the image here. There's a little trapezium of stars that's a nice target to hit first. Uh, they're 11th and 12th magnitude stars. So if your scope is capable of showing you those kind of stars, that's where to, that's where to start once you get into the ballpark here. And then this, this star here is actually relatively easy to see. That little trapezium is just up off here. And then you can at least know where the galaxy is. This might be visible as well. I think that's a tenth magnitude Something star. Like that, yeah. Something like a tenth magnitude star. This is a field star. of view, but I couldn't see yeah. the galaxy. So it's, it's a, it was a pretty object from the clubhouse. More, more reasons to come up to the clubhouse and observe. Yeah. Now, as hard as that is, can I go on to the next slide? This is, a, this is, a, this is the January. LVAS object of the month, uh, NGC 1514, which is a beautiful planetary in Taurus. Down around there someplace, I think. That's right. It's, it's um, Northern yes. part of Taurus, right off the map here. Right, right off there. of, uh, yep, the end of Perseus. Now, I looked at this the other night. I've never, I've never looked at it before. And the reason I wanted to bring it to your attention tonight is that this is one you really have to go out and look at. It, that central star is 9.4 magnitude. I've never seen a central star in a planetary that's that bright. And it, it was stunning. Now, I've got a lot of aperture to play with, but when I looked at it, I could see a faint fuzz around that star. When I slipped the Oxy-3 filter in, it just, at first I was like, that can't be it. That, it just can't be it, I must be on the wrong star field. When I popped the filter on, poof, there it is. I'm like, no way. So this is a good one to go out and try. If you've never seen it before, give yourself a little bit of a challenge here and, and try and find 15, 14. I don't think you'll be disappointed. If you've got a telescope that's probably 10 inches or more, um, to drive the light through the Oxy-3 filter because it's on 11 nanometer band pass. On a smaller telescope, it's like looking through a black tube. But if you've got a little bit of aperture to drive the light of that thing through it, man, oh man, is that mm -hmm. a beauty. That's a nice one. I'd never seen it before until Monday night. It was like, oh, Roger wants me to write a little blurb up so he can distribute it. You'll read about it, of course. Mm -hmm. um, perfect. So I just wanted to include that. Um, and you're right, they've worked, he and uh, Sue French, have worked out the details all the way through 2021. And some of them are challenging, yep. and some of them are also pretty easy. So it, it, it's, it's nice to get out there and observe. Come up to the clubhouse, Paul. Whose picture is there? Uh, this is shameless stolen off the internet. And I apologize for not crediting it. I should have put the little blurb on it. But we think this is Mario. That's Mario. That's your right? Yeah, it's a blow up of it. Yep. Nice job. I don't know what this little guy is right here. Look at that. That's a huge mm -hmm. little galaxy right there. That's solid galaxy. Yeah, you won't see that in your backyard telescope. Yeah. Nice job. <laughs> All right, one more thing to bring up before I forget. I did plan on doing an observation of uh, Algol, an eclipse of Algol, but we got clouded out. So I've already put this to work. I just got this 10 minutes ago, and it looks like there's a favorable one coming up in February on a Friday night. Uh, so I'll post something there. We'll give it a try. Basically, 
what we do is we get outside, I'll show the general area for a good begin. We'll have kind of an orientation meeting. And then it's basically every 15 minutes, I'll just call, come over, check it out. And we'll have a little sheet, you can write down the brightness. And then when it's over, uh, we'll kind of put these all together. And at the next meeting, next month's meeting, I'll show the results we got for that particular thing. But it's a really neat thing to watch this star. It'll fade about a magnitude and a half in just a couple hours. You know, the reason we bring all this stuff up is because we want you folks to get out and observe. And it doesn't matter what size telescope you own, pair of binoculars, telescope. I, I've got a 60 millimeter refractor that I, I drag out through the driveway every now and again. And it amazes me what you can see through a 60 millimeter refractor. So there's no excuse, you know, except, you know, it's cold outside. <laughs> I, I know. I know it's cold. But if you can't do it from your, from your backyard, come on up to the clubhouse most Friday and Saturday nights um, where the place is, uh, is hopping. And some nights there are a lot of people on the observing field, sometimes there are only a few. But it's a, it's a great place to meet new friends and, you know, get some observing in. And borrow a telescope and bring it out. Yeah, but in the telescope room downstairs, there's, pl there's plenty of stuff to borrow. Yeah. So something else that nobody's mentioned, I'm surprised, uh, is the supernova in M77. I didn't mention it because it isn't actually that bright. What was it, about 15th magnitude? It's about 15th magnitude. Yeah. You guys captured it on your on yeah. an ARIA. Yeah, we got it in ARIA yeah. and, and compared it to the picture that was published on the Sky and Telescope website. Mm -hmm. and they stole our picture. It was like exactly. It was right where it was. Right? It was exactly the Why same. Why wouldn't we? The same. <laughs> <laughs> we had to steal it before astronomy did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I looked for it the other night. I couldn't see it. We, we used Steve's telescope. Could you see M77, mm -hmm. but just not the. Not oh, yeah, the super sure. We could see the, you know, it's just a little bump <laughs> in the side, and you really got there to There it is. Because it's pretty, it's fairly bright and fuzzy. So, but, um, 77 is a nice galaxy to look at. It's a relatively easy one. It's a Seifert galaxy that's got a pretty uh, condensed nucleus. Uh, pretty easy to find and see this. It's a nice one. If when you, you find a picture on the web without the supernova in it and then look at it, it's, it, it sticks out. Mm -hmm. and that's what I've done. As a matter of fact, we looked at it through the 25 inch um, about a week and a half ago. And not only could you see the, some spiral structure, but you could see the faint outer halo of the galaxy as well. Astro uh, astronomy picture of the day last week, go back and scroll through them. I had a nice image of the galaxy and the, and the supernova. And you could see that same halo that I'm talking about. And you could see that. We could see that in the 25 inch scope. Yeah, good stuff, good stuff. Okay. All right, yeah. I think that's it for this, nice right? Question, judge. What's coming, is there anything coming up after this? Or? Um, just okay. the public report. Yeah, anybody have any questions or anything? I want to just mention that uh, I've been looking at Venus during the day. Okay. It's nice and clear. It's kind of cool that you have a now, earlier last week, the moon passed relatively nearby, and it made it an easy target to see it naked eye in the daytime. Um, it just, uh, well, a week or so ago, it passed greatest brilliancy, and it's coming up on greatest elongation west. Yeah, already. So it moves fast. But um, yeah, that's a, nice, that's a nice planet to look at, especially in the daytime. Especially in the daytime. All right. Thank you. Keep um, looking up. We will. Steve Plardy, observing. Do you want to click? No. You have a slide next? No. No, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can get them. I'll add with it. We had a work party on the 24th of November with 20 members showing up, volunteers. It was quite successful. Had, a, had pretty good weather that day, in fact. And we finished staining the first floor of the clubhouse and the barn. So we're done with that part uh, for the year. But next spring, we'll try and tackle a second floor. Uh, and uh, continue from there. So we're in pretty good shape. We've actually been ahead of schedule on the, st on the stain, and we're doing very well. We want to thank Dave Prouten for taking the lead on cutting some clapboard and uh, installing some sections that were kind of rotted around the clubhouse. That was completed as well, the mode was stained too during the last work party. Um, let's see, Paul Cacchetti and Chris Elledge had helped us install the, uh, the snow fence for the year. Mike Hill organized the second floor of the barn loft, did a nice job there. That's kind of the repository of the junk that people just sort of dump there. So every year or so we have to go through it. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Al Takeda for um, uh, continuing with his, his uh, inventory of the donation from Matt Ben Daniel. Matt, of course, a former member here, gave us a ton of optical equipment and camera equipment, which is very valuable. So. It Where is he now? I used to know him. He used to live upstairs. I haven't seen him in a long, long time. He's out in is Colorado. he in Colorado? Is he still yeah. racing fast? I don't know. I don't know. He's probably doing the weather report or something in Ames. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, 
Any question. Any question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're also... Uh, hey, even that girl's do it now. Oh, no. <laughs> At least they know something about climate well, change. Right half the time. Oh. <laughs> this coming year, we're going to be focusing more and more on mirror making activities at the clubhouse. And we have a committee There's put a together. I mean, there is, is there a slide for this? Is there a slide for this? Oh, okay. All right, yeah. You can read that. But some of the bullets, uh, there's a few of us who are kind of involved with this. The neuromatic machine, is that really a real thing? Mm -hmm. It sounds like something to see on a Neuromatic It slices it. slices it and forget So there's a real thing. Wait, there's more. Well, wait. This offer only. Um, yeah, Barry Jensen and George Roberts also offered to make an auto collimator for the club and donate some key components for it, which would be great. And we hope that they're actually salvaging most of the parts in the existing grinding machine now, which is a very good one, by the way, but it needs some upgrading. So that'll be done this year. And we're also dedicating some space at the clubhouse for a clean room, where people can actually go and grind and primarily polish mirrors, too, without interference. So we're going to do something. More than likely, we'll be reclaiming the evaporator room for the new neuromatic machine for polishing and we'll be sectioning off part of the polishing room now for both grinding and polishing. But we haven't quite come up with a, a final plan. We're gonna be working on that this winter. Um, and let's see, the, yeah, that, the auto collimator will go in the test tunnel when that's completed this year. So stay tuned, we'll be doing more. One last note, we had a work party scheduled for December 22nd, and we also had another get together for the following week, the 29th, to, to set up for the New Year's Eve party. would like to postpone the, tw the, the work party on the 22nd and combine them both for the 29th of December, and I will send out an announcement next week to let the, the membership know. So we'll postpone the one for the 22nd, do it on the 29th. It's primarily indoor work, cleaning and setting up for the New Year's Eve party, and also taking a look at the layout for the new product. Uh, we're making the setup, we're making the show. That's it. All right, thank you. Outreach. That's me. Hey, look, uh, you know, yes, Paul. Uh, sorry, I wanted to try to catch a little bit earlier. Uh, Tom Lanio, who invented the Miramatic, based it on uh, originally an Elgin polishing machines that were built in World War II for the military, and then Strasbau uh, used the same principles. And there's a proper way to use them, and there's a wrong way. I'll have to at some point work with Mike and the rest of the committee to show the right way to use it so that it really saves time in their making. Perfect. But Tom uh, did move to Florida um, and died at age 60 um, of a heart attack. But uh, he was drawing out sketches with the computer. This is going way back to Windows 00. zero. And uh, he did it with dashes and dots and X's and transmitted that to Mel Bartles. And then Mel continued uh, to promote it from there. And now there's some professionals working as well. Right. So we have a, a, a real investment in that. Excellent. Excellent. Steve mentioned the New Year's Eve party. If, you, uh, if you've got nothing going on that night, you want a real rocking time. Mm -hmm. I'm coming up to the clubhouse. Uh, I don't know what time does it start? Six o'clock? Six thirty. Six thirty. All right. So we can seven o'clock first. So there, there, are, there are, there's uh, all kinds of uh, horn blowing and fanfare every hour, yep, sure. and music and food and food, funny hats, funny hats and observing and. Did you come up? I invited my wife. She's like, uh, yeah, no. It's got heat. It's got heat. Remember last year we went out looking at radium flare. It was about 50 below zero. Remember that? It was nice. It was nice. But look, we had a, we had a pretty rough month in uh, in November. And, uh, we uh, we were at Acton Box Pro. Uh, it was a clouded out event, but they did have a, they did have a large indoor component. So you can read about that in the newsletter. Um, it was a nice night. There were 150 kids that showed up to that star party. 
the rest of them, the, the center school in Stowe got canceled, the Vining Elementary School in Dorica got postponed, and there are some others that are already um, on tap for the springtime. Um, so we're always looking for volunteers to help out. More information about these will come later on. And uh, that's all I have to say about outreach tonight. Um, oh no, there's one more thing. I was talking to Kelly Beebe, um, and he suggested that what we might want to do is some outreach for the eclipse coming up in January. Um, this is a late evening event and would probably not be suitable for the public, but um, Kelly suggested that we might want to contact the news agencies in Boston and maybe get some good press for the club. So we'll, we'll, we'll work through that as we get closer to the date, but I think that's a pretty good idea. Um, we get to see the entire eclipse, it just happens kind of like midway through the night. And so um, we probably won't get a lot of people wandering by. But anyway, um, that's what's coming up in January. But the uh, nice thing is the next day is a holiday. Is and the next day is Martin Luther King Day. It's a Sunday night, but the next day is a holiday. So, you know. Yeah. So. The next day, uh, January 1st, the New Horizons spacecraft is going by the trans-Neptunian object in the Hyperbell. On January 1st or the day after this? No, January 1st. January 1st, okay. January 1st, so that's, you know, that's kind of a big event. That will be a big event. That's nice. Actually, the closest encounter is at 12.33 a.m. Okay. Oh, while you guys are going so to be having your party. Well, your yeah. party's going on. If we're still, if we're still awake. <laughs> we're still awake. Is there any old business to tend to? Eileen? Uh, some more calendars just showed up. Somebody returned some. Okay. They bought, they never bought. And I still have handbooks. Okay. So if you need calendars or handbooks. See, Eileen, after the meeting, calendars and handbooks. All right. Um, I have some new business. Um, I was talking with Roger Ibister, of course, I talked to him about three times a week. I love talking to that guy, actually. And um, he and I were both discussing uh, some of the observers that we know, uh, Sue and Alan French came, to, came up in a conversation. And Roger suggested that what we may want to do as a club is offer those guys uh, an honorary club membership uh, in recognition of their years, decades of, of, of astronomy. Um, Sue French is, should be well known to most of us. Um, she's published uh, 240, or <coughs> has she gotten to 240 yet, Kelly, or is, it, is that where she's going to end it? So that was the idea, it was end at 240. At 20 years of writing Sky and Telescope articles, Sue's going to retire. Just a newbie. Retire. She's, she's just a newbie. Mm -hmm. But she's also got some, uh, some excellent uh, books. These are, are, are samples of her articles, Celestial Sampler and Deep Sky Wonders. Um, in the December issue, um, Peter uh, included this quote uh, made by Rick Feinberg back a while back. Sue French offers a rare combination, an encyclopedic knowledge of the night sky, exceptional observing skills, and a trans transcendent ability to convey the excitement of stargazing through the written word. Um, she and her husband are, are uh, and they even have an asteroid named after them, but some of the folks right in this very room have asteroids named after them. Um, when Mars was, right Mark? Right? Mine's in opposition. Maybe. Is it really? <laughs> 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 yeah, it's there. So there. How much lower than yours? <laughs> <laughs> well, Sue and Alan French have an asteroid named after them. It was 1996 PB1 was discovered um, in Lake Placid, New York. Um, asteroid number 17638 was uh, named after them back in 2002. Um, it's located here. Uh, there's Mars. There's Earth. There's the asteroid. Um, while Mars was gliding past Neptune last week, it, it's also been gliding past uh, their asteroid. It's a 19.3 magnitude, I'm thinking Ario, <laughs> um, speck of rock that you could actually observe with that telescope. Sure. I, I'm sure that's well within the reach of that, of that equipment. Of um, you know, we, we know these guys. If you've, if you've ever been to uh, Stellafane, uh, the Conjunction, Aruna Hill, Neath, you know these guys are super into astronomy. And we thought it would be a nice gesture if the club honored them with a, a, a lifetime honorary membership for, for the both of them. Um, I checked the bylaws. Um, it required 10 signatures, which I got. I sent to John. Uh, John, I got the hard copy if you need it. And I think all we have left to do is to put it to a vote. I asked Dick Coolish if there was anything more in the bylaws than that, and kind of thinking, no, we're just going to do it. I claimed ignorance. I yeah. claimed ignorance <laughs> as well. He does that a lot. Um, I, I, would, I would open it for discussion if anybody would like to debate it. Here, there is precedence. The night I joined the Amateur Telescope Makers of Boston, was, I joined at the April of 1992 meeting. And that was the night the membership elected Johnny Carson as an honorary <laughs> <laughs> 
I sat, I was right over there, we're recording right where you are, I was sitting right over there, and I thought, I have found my people. This is just fantastic. So, I would put it open for discussion, if anybody has anything to say, pro or con. Um, Glenn, you, you know those guys personally, what do you think? Put them in. Put them in, see? Sounds good to me. It sounds, I'd like to add a proviso that we have to get them here to present it to the <laughs> I, I would I bet we could. And get them to do one of our talks. I'll bet we could. I bet we yeah, could. That would be That'd great. Be awesome. Yep. Yeah. All right. So I think that we just, we just have to put it um, to a vote. So I wrote something down so it would sound very official. Let me read it. Do you need the motion? I, I'm gonna, I was going to do the motion, and I was going to have something. Second. You second. <laughs> so there you go. Um, Usually I give the motion. So, that's right, I know. So, <laughs> I trust you. There you go. So we all know what the motion is, right? Um, to elect um, these guys as honorary club members. So all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say no. Okay. Bang the meteorite. I'll bang the meteorite. There it is. So it's awesome. Before we lose it, we have about 15 honorary members, and I don't think anybody's got a list of them anymore. Probably not. I know there's a provision in the bylaws for how many we can have, and Chris told me there was room for, for these guys. So, you know, that's great. That's fantastic. Um, we'll craft some sort of proclamation and send it to them, and, and I'll, um, I'll put out that invitation to come and um, pick up the proclamation themselves. Go ahead. Yeah, one thing I was going to suggest, I talked this over with Rich, I've been supporting uh, Jim Mulaney, some of you know him, he worked, worked for Sky and Telescope for a number of years, he's published a lot of books, and he was a member of this club, in fact, at one time, and I've been putting in for his membership, so that might be a thing for somebody to think about during the holidays, is a gift membership to somebody you know who's an amateur astronomer, who might not be able to, might not be able to make our meetings, but it'd be kind of a nice gesture to make them... Uh, uh, yes, but who would you get? Maybe legitimate members of the club, whether it be senior membership or whatever. So I would encourage any of you. I that's actually an excellent idea. That's a no, that's what makes a nice holiday gift. Birthdays, holidays, graduations. It's awesome. I just re up Jim today, so if you know of anybody that deserves that, there you go. Nice spot. Fantastic. Thanks, Glenn. Let's see what's next. Questions, comments. All right. Well, if there's nothing more, we're going to move on. It's finally time to bring up our guest speaker. So I um, tonight we're going to be um, we're going to uh, be uh, uh, treated. I know trying uh, to Dr. Stella Kafka. Kafka. She is the director of the American Association of Variable Star Observers, of which I'm about to become a new member. Um, I will unfold. I, I drove over here in her awesome little um, Stella mobile, and um, we were talking about variable stars. And I admitted that I, I'm not the greatest variable star observer, um, but I do like the idea of cataclysmic variables. I think those are kind of cool to think about, to read about. And I also like just pulsating variables in general. As a matter of fact, the light curve up here um, is from the AADSO website uh, of, for our Leporis. Um, it's one of my very favorite stars in the sky. If you've never seen it, well, there's one you want to look at. And it's, it's, it's starting to drop in, in brightness. This winter will be at a minimum. And that will offer it to, it is one of the, I think it's the reddest star in the sky. And so it's a long period variable star with about 427-ish day period. Um, every 40 years it does a really nice dip. I'm down to about 11.7th magnitude. It's a really awesome star to look at. You can see the color in the finest scope of your telescope. That's how intense the red is. It's fantastic. So I highly, highly recommend that. Well, before she became the director of the AVSO, Stella worked at the Ciro Tolo, Tololo, Tololo, I can't even say it, Inter-American Observatory in Chile. She's worked for the Spitzer Science Center at Caltech, the Carnegie Institute uh, of Washington uh, in the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, and for the American Institute of Physics Publishing. Um, the AVSO, of course, as we all know, is uh, an international nonprofit organization of variable star observers whose mission is to enable anyone anywhere to participate in scientific discovery through variable star astronomy. Um, Stella's lecture this evening is Variable Stars and Their Stories. So let's give a warm at mob welcome to Dr. Stella Kopp. And while she's setting up, I just wanted to thank Mike Hill for the refreshments tonight. I hope Mike's here.
So good evening everyone, I guess is, I am your entertainment for today. Um, my name is Stella Kafka and I am the Executive Director of the ABA. So and I have to admit that your club has a very special place in my heart, simply because it was my first outing from the snowstorm of 2015 when I first arrived here. So you saved me from uh, loneliness and I really appreciate that. <laughs> so with that, I would like to start actually with an announcement. The ABSO is actually, we are hiring. So if you want to join our team, uh, we're hiring a programmer and we're hiring a part-time office as, uh, assistant. So uh, if you're interested, please send us an email to, at uh, abso.org. I'm going to send you more information. Um, if you know anyone who could be interested, please uh, direct them to us, okay? So I would like to start by reminding you that the ABSO actually started here at the Harvard Observatory with the then director of Harvard Observatory uh, gathered a group of amateur astronomers to take data for these projects. Um, this is pretty much how we looked like back then, and this is how we look now. We're talking about an international organization. We have 4,000 emails in our roster. We have both professional and non-professional astronomers. We have, you name the, the demographics, we have it here. We are a group of interested people trying to understand some of the most crazy phenomena in, in, in the universe. The reason why we're doing what we're doing is because we want to enable anyone, anywhere, to participate in scientific discovery through variable star astronomy. This is our mission. And you see some very strong words there. You see enable, meaning that we provide the resources to everybody equally so that they can actually uh, be part of the AVSO. You see anyone. We don't really care about your socioeconomic background. We don't really care about whether you have an accent or not. We don't care about the, the skin of your color. You should be able to come join us. Also, anywhere. Access to our resources should be available no matter where you are. And my very favorite one, participate. Being an active member of the organization. Being an active collaborator of this wonderful, wonderful uh, international group of individuals who are trying to understand, trying to probe the universe. So when I was uh, presenting this, uh, when I was preparing this um, presentation, I was trying to figure out when in the history of humankind the first variable star was ever presented or was ever discussed, especially in the written record. Does anyone know? Ah, so I found this manuscript on archive, you can actually download it, that says that Aldo was mentioned in the Cairo calendar 3,000 years ago to have a period of 2.85 days. The Cairo calendar was a religious calendar of ancient Egyptians, and they were recording important phenomena. They were recording things of, uh, of agriculture, things of religion, things of culture for them, and this came down all the way to us. So I, I think it's really cool. First variable star was actually recorded 3,000 years ago. So before I start telling you all about variable stars, I would like to play a game. Who likes games? Okay, it's nine o'clock at night. I'm gonna fall asleep, you have to talk to me, okay? <laughs> Who likes games? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, and the game goes as follows. This is a part of the night sky, and each dot represents a star. Bigger dots are brighter stars, smaller dots are fainter stars. And I want to assign a number to each dot that represents its brightness. And because it's my game and my rules, I'm gonna do things backwards. So in this case, the brightest dot, the biggest star in my sky, has number 51 assigned to it. The faintest dot, the, the, uh, fainter, the, faintest, the smallest dot, the faintest star in my sky, has number 91 to it. And then this is 61, 85, 75, 64. Yes? So we have a star here that does not have a number assigned to it. So according to those rules, let's, let's name the star Mary. I like Mary. It's a really good name. How bright is Mary with respect to the rest of the stars in, in its vicinity? 62. 62. 62. 58. 68. Okay. 64. You say 58. Not 64. Okay. So this is Mary one night. Oh, it's bigger, right? That's 60. So pretty much, is it as bright as this? No. Is it as faint as this? No. How about as faint as this? 
close. No, no, it's close, right? It's so I go out a different night, and here's the same part of the sky, same other stars, and here's Mary tonight. How bright is Mary? 95. 95. So again, is it as bright as this? No. Brighter or fainter? Fainter. fainter. How about this? Fainter. How about this? Fainter. Fainter. Maybe. Maybe, right? Close enough. So here's a third night. Here's Mary tonight. How bright is she? <laughs> again, as bright as that? How about that? This one? So, I would say, yeah, somewhere in the middle of those two. Mary is a variable star in the sense that its brightness is changing every time we observe it with respect to the other star in its vicinity. And by the way, congratulations, you just built your first light curve. So a light curve is the brightness variation of a variable star with time, just a record of how a star is changing. And that is happening with respect to another star whose brightness is not changing with time. All we were doing is compare our variable star with a group of <laughs> non variables, that's all. This is another example. You can see the, the measurements of a variable star and you can see the non variable star here. And you can take the measurements with any means you can imagine. You can observe through binoculars with your own eyes, through a telescope with your own eyes, using a DSLR camera, using a CCD camera. Actually, this is a composite of three different images taken of a part of the globular <coughs> cluster the same night. And if you play, pay uh, close attention, you see some stars whose brightness are actually changing. Let's play find the variable star here. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah. Just you circle around those three uh, images. You can see variable stars, not just a, a concept. This is how they look like. And they can change as quickly as the same night or the same week, or uh, within a, a, a week, or within a month, or within years. And this is the type of variable stars we're going to talk about today. So variable stars come in uh, all kinds of groups, and classes, and categories, and subcategories, and we really like dividing them in all kinds of, of things, and they're, they're, they're boring. So because I don't really like this categorization, today I'm, we're going to reclassify them. And we're going to call, call them good, we're going to call them bad, and we're going to call them explosive. And because it's my talk and I can do whatever I want, I'm going to change my title. Variable stars, the good, the bad, and the explosive. And I'm going to refer to them as such for the rest of the night. And I'm going to start with the good ones. The good ones are the reliable ones. These are the stars that are doing the same thing again and again in a very reliable way. These are the ones that can be your best friend. You can even predict their behavior and go out and observe them. They, do the, they have the same behavior again and again, and they have, they're in two different categories, the binary stars and pulsating variables. And I'm gonna start with binary stars, actually. Binary stars are two stars that are gravitationally bound together. They're moving around the common center of mass. This is uh, an artist's redemption of, of how they look like, and this is pretty much um, a, a cartoon showing these two stars moving around the common center of mass. Actually, depending on whose paper you read, <coughs> whose scientific study you read, up to 75% in our galaxy are in some kind of binary system. So they're, they're really extremely abundant. And this is one of the examples. This is Sirius. How many of you have observed Sirius? Excellent. How many of you have resolved the Sirius system? Sirius A and B. Ah, awesome. So this is a binary star, star system here. Um, Sirius A is a star like, say, a little bit more massive than the sun. So it's nothing special. Sirius B, though, is a white dwarf. And a white dwarf is a star that has the mass of the sun squeezed to the size of the Earth. What that means is that they're extremely bright, extremely, <laughs> extremely dense, and extremely hot. So although in the optical wavelength, Sirius A is way, way brighter than Sirius B, when we go to X-rays, Sirius B outshines Sirius A. I find it extremely, these are both real images of the system. Another thing that I find interesting is that uh, the separation between the two stars is just 20 astronomical units and their orbit lasts for just 50 years. So what that means is that the youngest member of this audience can go and look at Sirius <coughs> A and B um, this year, 
and then go back 50 years from now and see the same position. I think it's really cool. This is one of the few systems we can actually do this. However, most frequently, we know that a, an object is a member of a binary star, star system where the inclination of the orbit is just right so that one star actually passes in front or behind the other and it steals a little bit of the light. This is um, an artist's invention showcasing exactly that particular phenomenon, a little movie. So you see one star actually moving um, behind its, its companion and then passing in front of it. And when it's moving in front and behind, the, this is a light curve. Brightness variation with time, the brightness of the, the system drops. All we see through a telescope is a dot. We don't see the two stellar components. But if, I, if we take picture after picture after picture of it, we see this dip in the brightness of the system. And this, uh, this is a telltale um, sign that this is a binary star system. This is, again, a cartoon of exactly the same phenomenon. You see the two stars together. The brightness is, uh, is pretty much outside eclipse. And then one star going in front of the other. Uh, and you see a primary eclipse and a secondary eclipse. Um, Actually, we have two different types of eclipses. We have what we call a total eclipse, when one star is uh, hiding uh, behind its companion or passing right in front of it. And we have what we call a partial eclipse, when one of the two stars just grazes the, uh, the, uh, the atmosphere of its companion. So it's just a small, stealing just a small part of the light. This is a collection of real lectures. These are actually data that showcase exactly the same phenomenon. Actually, ALGO, the system that was known to ancient Egyptians, is a binary star system. It's a system like that. So ancient Egyptians knew about eclipsing binaries, and they knew how to derive the orbital period around the common center of mass. I find it fascinating. Actually, even more fascinating, the same technique that ancient Egyptians used 3,000 years ago to detect the orbital period of ALGO is now used to detect exoplanets around other stars. How many of you have heard about the transit method? So the transit method is pretty much an eclipse. That's all there is to it. Exactly the same technique. However, you need much more sensitive equipment because in this case, instead of having one star eclipsing its companion, you have a planet, which is much, much smaller, eclipsing its companion. So for example, if you have a star like the sun, and a, a, a planet as big as Jupiter, you see a nice big dip during eclipse, during transit. If you have a planet like Neptune, uh, 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 eclipsing a, a, a star like the sun, you see this particular dip. Can you see the Earth here? You have to take my word for it, right? <laughs> You're not very close. There's a tiny little dot here that represents the Earth that is eclipsing a star like our sun. So, you barely see the effect um, through a telescope from the Earth, and this is why, in order to detect exoplanets, we need space telescopes. We need really very accurate measurements of those eclipses. We really we need to get past the stellar the um, atmosphere of the Earth. This is a, a collection of um, of transits, exoplanet transits. These were taken by 10 and 12 inch telescopes. So this is something you can do from the ground, not from Cambridge, Massachusetts, but from the ground in order to actually detect exoplanet transits. I find it fascinating. So second type of good variable stars, these are the pulsators. Pulsators are single stars. Actually, a stellar pulsation is kind of a, a middle-aged crisis in a star's life. Stars are like humans. Um, Stars, let's make, let me take a step back. Stars are big balls of gases that are held together with what we call hydrostatic equilibrium. Hydrostatic equilibrium is pretty much the battle between two main forces. It's the, the force of gravity that is trying to push everything together in the universe, one of the strongest forces uh, in nature. So it tries to push every single gas uh, molecule in the atmosphere of a star as close as possible. At the same time, at the very center of each star, there is a nuclear factory <coughs> that burns hydrogen into other elements. And as every factory, it emits gas. You can, you can think about it like heat. And that heat has pressure. 
So that pressure is trying to pull aside all the layers of the star. So pretty much you have two competing forces. You have the force of gravity that is pulling everything together and the force of uh, radiation that is pulling everything apart. And at some point they find an equilibrium, they reach an agreement where they're more or less equal. And the star is hanging out like that. So this is a movie I really like because it's a really good artist's redemption of how it looks like. So you have a nice big gas ball here where um, gravity and gas pressure are happily living together without distracting each other. However, hydrogen at the center of those stars is not infinite. At some point, it gets exhausted. And at that point, for a momentary uh, or a snapshot in the life of a star, gravity wanes. And then radiation pressure takes over and says, no, 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 I have to pull everything apart. And it, it actually uh, has a stronger effect. Then gravity wins again and push everything together. Gravitational pressure is trying, radiation pressure is trying to pull everything apart. And you see this battle of these two forces that result to a pulsation of the star. I'm gonna play this again. Simply because I think that it's the best prediction that they found um, when it comes to when it comes to pulsations. So again, in hydrostatic equilibrium, and at some point, hydrostatic equilibrium breaks, and the star starts to pulsate. So it physically changes its size. It expands and contracts with time. And these are time scales that we can actually measure. I really like this movie. I can play with them. Do it. So, it's going to blow up one of these times. Beg your pardon? It's going to blow up one of these times. Uh, nothing but stay. <laughs> so pretty much you have a little bouncy star, and this is reflected in the light here. You see increases and decreases of the brightness of the star um, that we can actually observe. Here's an example of a pulsating viral, one of my very favorite stars. Actually. This is Kai Sydney, and it belongs somewhere. Why? Here in the constellation of Cygnus. How many of you have seen that? Right. The reason why I really like that star is because it has the, ha the largest variation in brightness of any pulsating variable that we know of. When it's really very bright, it reaches the third magnitude. You can actually see it with your naked eyes. And when it's faint, you really need a telescope to see it. This is a 14th magnitude. This is an ADSO light curve, actually. And you can see that. The, uh, this letter represents a perfect synergy of what our observers can do. We need visual observers when the star is really bright, and we really need CCD and DSLR observers when the star is really faint. So in order to build this beautiful light curve. So the period, the pulsation period, is 407 days, so it expands and contracts once every, every 400 days. Now, a question you could ask is, OK, Stella, this is great. It's a fun little, little pulsator. But you said that pulsating variables are the good ones, right? These are the reliable ones. These are the ones that we can actually go out and predict. It's going to uh, pulsate in and out. And the light curve is going to go up and down. And it will keep going up and down and up and down and up and down. So let's do the following. Let's build a project where we make a super list of all these pulsators. Let's dedicate our telescope time to go and figure out what their periods are. It goes up and down. Let's record it, publish a paper, we have to do that too, and then go do something else with our lives. Why should we observe a thing that is doing the same thing again and again and again? Why waste telescope time? That's not exactly the case. This is a long-term light curve of Chi Cygni, a long-term ADSO light curve of Chi Cygni, more than 100 years of data. And actually, we've been the data. Uh, by averages of three days. And you can see what you expect, right? It goes up and down and up and down, bright and faint and bright and faint for 100 years. At the same time, if you pay close attention to the light curve, you see there's a little bump here. You see this bump? Mm, you can see it here as well. Uh, it's here as well, but you don't see it here. But you don't see it here. If you see it here, 
So there's a little bump that not only is not there all the time, but it moves on the lateral, right? So you see it down there in this case, you see it up here in this case. This bump represents an instability in the atmosphere of the star. You see, stars are not solid bodies. They don't go out and in in a uniform way. They're big, big gas balls. So all those atmospheric layers are moving with different speeds. And as one is going out, another one's coming in. As they meet, they collide and they shock. And that shock gives rise to this, this little bump. But we wouldn't know that this little bump existed if we didn't have 100 years of data. And by studying this kind of phenomenon, these little bumps that appear in 100 years of data, astronomers make models to understand stellar interiors. We can't dissect a star. This is our way of figuring out the mechanics of a star, how stars work. So if I tell you that we don't have enough data, will you believe me? That's one, that's one of the reasons why we need long-term lifers of those stars. And that's why every single data point matters. Visual data, DSLR data, CCD data. That's why we keep observing those stars again and again and build this kind of, of uh, long-term light curves. The interesting thing with this star is that it's extremely bright. So astronomers used a different sort of um, technique to measure its actual size. So these are four different measurements, uh, interferometric measurements taken uh, of Chi Cygni. Here is the Sun and the Earth's orbit for scale between the, the largest size and the smaller size of the star, there is a 40% changes in its radius. So just imagine a star that expands and contracts by 40% in a time period of 400 days. For me, it's mind blowing. It's actually phenomenal. And the fact is, we can actually observe it. We can study it and we try to understand it. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. Since we are at the Harvard Observatory, I have to tell her a story. And I'm pretty sure that each one of you knows this story way, way better than I do. Uh, there's a different type of variable stars uh, called um, uh, Cepheids. Uh, and this wonderful lady who actually spends hours and hours and hours cataloging them in the, in the small Magellanic Cloud. How many of you have seen the small Magellanic Cloud? It's phenomenal. If you ever are in the Southern Hemisphere, please look up. It's, it's unbelievable. I, I was really extremely fortunate to be able to live actually in Chile for a couple of years. And this was uh, both the, the large and the small Magellanic clouds were my companions. Uh, so what she did was actually she uh, found that um, the period and the apparent brightness of the stars have a relationship in the sense that stars with longer periods have, uh, have higher apparent brightnesses than uh, stars with shorter periods. She actually assumed that all those stars that she was studying were more or less at the same distance. It was a correct assumption. She was studying stars in this particular galaxy. And she derived uh, a relationship between the period, the luminosity, and the distance of those stars. And why does this matter? Because actually, this gave us a way of measuring distances to these stars all the way in the universe. Distances are extremely difficult to measure. It's not that I'm holding a yardstick and I'm giving them one side to my friend here and I'm holding the another one here. And yay, we found the distance between two stars. It's not as straightforward. So we're using the pulsation period and the brightness variation of those kind of stars to calibrate distances all the way to nearby galaxies. This is a method that is still being used, uh, the Cepheid method. Cepheid variables are really highly desirable variables to, to discover and observe, simply because it actually helps us probe uh, the nearby universe. So Henrietta's work, variable stars, are helping us define fundamental properties in the universe. So enough of the good ones. Let's go to the bad ones. And this is a prototype. Anyone recognizes this one? <laughs> I'll take it as a yes. <laughs> Good. So this is our own star, the sun. So um, the first person actually who had the best recorded uh, observations of the sun 
uh, is Galileo. He observed about 400 years ago. And legend tells us that Galileo took a piece of, piece of glass, like the one that's in the, in the windows, <coughs> and he put it on top of fire, and he collected smoke. And he took this uh, smoke glass, and he put it in front of his telescope in order to do observations of the sun. Well, Galileo died blind. <laughs> Just say that again. <laughs> we know very well we're not supposed to observe the sun unless we have a special filter. So, Galileo died blind, and we're not going to do that, right? <laughs> However, he was uh, one of the, the, the first person who left a very, very detailed, very detailed record of the sun's rotation. He was the first person who actually came and said, well, the sun is not perfect. Um, it's not a perfect sphere. It's not a perfect object. It has these little dots on it, and those dots are moving. He got in trouble with church, who is not advisable for that time. Um, but at the same time, he was the one who actually showcased that a celestial object is not perfect, and actually urged others to study it. And he did some study. He's the first one who derived the orbital period of the sun. We now we know that the sun is definitely not a perfect sphere, and definitely not a quiet sphere, if not anything else. It has all kinds of phenomena. Uh, it has spots, but other than spots, it has granules, uh, it has coronal mass ejections, it has spicules, it has prominences, it has flares, it has anything and everything you can imagine. And we know that all those are because of the sun's magnetic field. So other than the, uh, the north-south magnetic field of the sun, uh, the, the global magnetic field that it has. It has mini dipoles all over the place where material uh, magnetic field lines emerge and they come back. They look more or less like that, mini magnets. Uh, and this is what directs uh, material um, outside the, the photosphere of, this, of the sun, or the, the surface, or whatever you want to call it. Actually, occasionally, some of these magnetic field lines break. And when something like that happens, we have what we call a flare. And during that flare, a whole bunch of uh, high energy particles are being ejected in the interstellar medium. We also know that other stars have flares as well. And of course, we can't observe other stars as closely as the sun, but we can take light curves. And through the light curves, this very characteristic shape of the light curves, we know that a star is, is actually ejecting material in its environment. So you have a, a, a an abrupt increase of the brightness of the star and the release of energy and the decline as energy is actually being released as a result of the flare. And again, this is all because of uh, magnetic fields in those stars. So we know that pretty much every, almost every star out there has a magnetic field, um, and almost every star can have flares up to eight point. Um, exactly because those, um, those spots or active <coughs> regions are attached to the layers of, the, of uh, those stars. Actually, why are we? Yeah. And they rotate with the layers of, of the stars that start spinning around its axis. We call these rotational variables. So why do I even bother talking to you about those? Why, why are they special? Why do we even care? Well, now we know that there is a relationship between the activity of the star, how active it is, meaning how big its uh, active regions are, how fast it rotates, how fast it spins around its axis, and how old it is, in the sense that younger stars are more active and they spin faster. So when we actually uh, observe this kind of activity, detect this kind of activity, uh, assess how fast it is, how fast the rotation is, we can find the age of the star. And this is an example here. So a, a hundred million uh, old star has a faster rotation of the than a larger amplitude of its rotation. This is a one billion uh, old star, and this is lighter. This is a star like our sun, which by the way is considered to be a very quiet star. Why does this matter? Well, stars don't come with uh, birth certificates. We, we can't, there's no other way that we can tell that stars that are in, in our galaxy, single stars in our galaxy, have a specific age. This is the way of doing it. So by studying rotation rates of stars, taking light curves, and assessing how fast they rotate, we can actually calibrate their age. And again, properties of variable stars are really essential 
in order to, to assess this, uh, uh, this property of them and actually get fundamental, uh, fundamental parameters from them. Make sense? Do you want to go out and observe additional value? All right, so enough with us again. Let's go to the explosives. And these are some of my favorite ones. I'm going to talk about cataclysmic fire this time. And these are binary star systems consisting of a white dwarf and a star that is half of the mass of the sun in a distance that is less than one astronomical unit. What did we say about a white dwarf? As massive as the sun, but as big as the Earth, so extremely dense. So what that means is that its gravitational field is extremely strong. So when you put another star right next to it, it tends to suck the light out of it. Its gravitational pull is actually uh, eating the, the, um, the layers of its uh, companions. So it looks more or less like that. It's stellar cannibalism in action. So that's one thing. Another thing is, because of their, their small distance, their binary star systems that move around this common center of mass, the orbital period is less than 10 hours. In comparison, how long does it take for the Earth to go around the sun? God, oh, how, how long does it take for the Earth to go around the sun days? 3 to 65 and some change, thank you. I get a mini heart attack right there. So a, a year, right? So just imagine 10 hours, that thing is spinning like crazy. The result of that is that instead of material going directly from one star to another, it forms a, 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 a siphon of material that spirals in and falls on the star. And this is what we call an accretion disk. So these are excellent uh, sites to understand accretion phenomena. Um, accretion disks uh, exist everywhere in nature. You see them around black holes, you form stars around accretion, uh, with accretion disks, you form planets in accretion disks. However, when it comes to black holes, they're really very far away, so you can't study them in detail. When it comes to protoplanets, they tend to be embedded in big dust clouds, so you can't exactly see them. <laughs> so cataclysmic variables are our best bet of actually understanding accretion phenomena in nature. So occasionally, when, uh, when we eat, we tend to burp. So these stars tend to burp as well. Um, we, they have what we call outbursts, which are excursions from a quiescence level up. And these actually show instabilities in the way that material is falling onto the whiteboard. Um, so this is an NPSO visual light curve of SS Sydney. This is, um, actually we have more than 300,000 uh, data, visual data on this star alone. It's a, it's a gem, it's, a, it's beautiful. Um, showcasing this behavior of burps or bursts. Now, oh God, we just had dinner. What happens when you eat too much, too quickly? Do I have any kids in the in the room? What happens when you eat too much too quickly? What happens when the cat throw up? You throw up. Thank you. It happens in those stars as well. So there are times where the white dwarf accretes a lot of material on its surface. It it actually just accumulates it in a way that is too fast for it to digest. So as a result. It, uh, it forms a blanket of material around it. And it reaches specific temperature and pressure, and that whole thermonuclear runaway effect starts at the surface of the white dwarf, the atmosphere of the white dwarf, and kaboom. It really throws up. That's what we call a nova explosion. So nova are eruptions of the atmosphere of the white dwarf when enough material is being accumulated really fast on the surface. And they're extremely bright phenomena, actually. This is a real image from the Hubble Space, Space Telescope of Nova Cygni in 1992. They don't destroy the star. They don't even destroy, they don't even touch the, the companion. Nothing really happens. So the, um, the white dwarf starts accreting again. But you know, white dwarfs are like humans. They never learn. So some of them show multiple eruptions. So they throw up again, again, and again. And this is what we call a recurring nova. This is an example of a Ricari Nova. This is Tick one of the most popular Ricari Nova in my community. Um, here's the, the central star here. There's a whole bunch of material around it as a result of multiple eruptions uh, from the white dwarf. 
This is a real image from the Hubble Space Telescope. So the first eruption of T-Pix was detected in 1890. It turns out that it has a, a recurrence period of about 22 years. So 1890, 1902, 1920, 1944, 1966, it skipped one in 2011. And believe it or not, there's a bet out there for when the next one is going to be, so you can actually join the pool if you want to. Um, so we don't know what's going to happen uh, next, but this is one of the most popular recurrent novel that we have right now. However, there are times when these stars do not um, you do not um, blow up their external uh, layers. Actually, they do process material. They do grow in mass. And they reach what we call the Chandra Sekhar unit, 1.4 solar masses. Why is 1.4 solar mass so critical for those white dwarfs? It's critical because for this type of white dwarf, carbon starts fusing in their center, and that is catastrophic. That starts a, a series of nuclear reactions that actually lead to a big explosion and kaboom. It completely kills the star. It completely blows it up. And that is a supernova 1A, right? So supernova 1As are results of white dwarfs <coughs> reaching 1.4 solar masses and going kaboom. So it's more or less the same mass of a white dwarf that produces supernova 1 days, and they're extremely bright. Here's an example of beautiful spiral galaxy. You can see actually the center, and this is a supernova 1A. So you can see it's as bright as its parent galaxy, and not only that, they happen everywhere. They're not uh, specific to a specific type of a galaxy. Does anyone recognize this galaxy? No. It's a very popular galaxy among stargazers. That's why I'm asking. 101. M101. M101. Thank you. So this is M101. Beautiful, beautiful dust lane, spiral arcs. It's the center of the galaxy. And this is a supernova 1A. This is actually an X-ray image of an elliptical galaxy. So completely different morphology. No star forming ridges. No dust. Very smooth from the center out. This is a supernova 1A. Now, exactly because all those events happen as a result of the eruption of a 1.4 solar mass white dwarf, they expect it to be identical, and actually they are. So this is um, a light curve, brightness variation, with time of a number of events. Uh, each different dot, each different color dot represents one event. So we put all the light, the light curves together, and you can see actually they fit a specific curve. And actually, their absolute magnitude is expected to be the same. This is uh, one of the of a cartoon, more or less, spectrum of those supernovae. And you can see all kinds of uh, elements that are being created, like silicon and carbon, but ma magnesium and iron and oxygen and calcium. So these are really good sites to, to form these kind of elements. One thing you don't see is hydrogen. Lack of hydrogen spectra actually is a telltale uh, example or a telltale um, identification of those things. So we're looking for the light curve shape, we're looking for these elements, and we're looking for the lack of hydrogen in a spectrum of a star like that when we're studying, <coughs> in order to be able to at least identify them as a supernova one. Why is that important? This is what makes them standard candles. The standard candle is an object whose properties look the same no matter where we look in the universe. So if they look like that in the nearby in the nearby galaxy, they look exactly the same, buried deep in the universe. If they look like this in the next door, in the galaxy next door, they should look exactly the same in a galaxy far, far away. Why is that important? Well, if you know the absolute magnitude of those objects, which you know, it's the same for all of them, and you measure its magnitude at peak, at peak brightness, you just plug it in this little equation. You might do a little bit of, of correction for interstellar reddening. Plug it in this equation, you get the distance there. And remember what I said about distances. Extremely difficult to measure. So we can go all the way to galaxy clusters because of those objects. So again, supernova, very variable stars. And we're studying them in order to derive fundamental properties of, um, of uh, objects such as distances, fundamental properties of the universe such as distances. Not only that, once we know the distance to the parent galaxy, 
we can actually um, do a little bit of uh, more spectroscopy to see how far away it moves uh, away from us. We can do cosmology. So these were the first objects that were used in order to actually probe fundamental properties of the universe. Because of them, for the first time, we knew that the, the universe was expanding. Not only was it expanding, but it was accelerating, it was moving fast. And there's this magic thing called dark energy that is driving this acceleration. And in case you're, you're wondering whether it's important or not, well, in 2011, the Nobel Prize in Physics was assigned, was awarded two teams, international teams of astrophysicists who used for the first time distant supernova to derive fundamental properties of the universe. However, these are not the most spectacular explosion of the universe. These are. These are collisions of two black holes or two neutron stars or black hole and a neutron star. These are what we call gamma ray bursts. And actually those explosions really are, are visible really very far <coughs> in the universe. This is a GRB here. You can see the little dot, right? That appears and disappears really fast. This is a redshift T. You can't even see the parent galaxy. But you can see this particular eruption. And actually, Quite recently, we found out that uh, those, or some of those, are um, progenitors of gravitational waves. The Nobel Prize in Physics in 2017 was awarded for the detection of gravitational waves from these sources. And actually, there was a detection quite recently uh, that was observed visually. This was uh, this is actually a series of real images of this event. This was uh, supposed to be a collision of two neutron stars. Uh, by the way, the detection happened with a one meter class telescope in Chile. So those things can be extremely bright. So some of you may be observing those in the near future. Yes. What's that? You got one of the. Yeah, so next stop, ladies and gentlemen. All right, wonderful. So I hope I gave you an idea of what's going on um, in the universe. Just the tip of the iceberg. <coughs> you know, we are, as humans, we're all explorers. <coughs> when we look up, we look out. And we try to understand where we are in the universe. We try to understand what's out there. And it gives us perspective for life. It's a good, healthy thing to have. So, once upon a time, we used to take our boats and actually explore the Earth. Been there, done that, and wish we could actually <laughs> join the, the Starship uh, ship Enterprise or actually Starman, anyone for yeah. Tesla? <laughs> um, but we can't do that yet. You know, you don't know. Um, what we can do, actually, is make the same trip from the Earth using our telescope. So I would like to spend just a couple of minutes to tell you how the AVSO can help you start your own observing program and participate in data acquisition from your telescope, from your binocular, from your DSLR camera, from your home. So how to get started? You need equipment, your eyes, binoculars, DSLR camera, whatever. I have just a pair of binoculars. I'm a very recent visual observer. And it's fascinating even witnessing the changes in the brightness of a star from one night to another. It's, it's mind blowing. And I'm a professional astronomer, by the way. Okay, so I've seen lots of light groups, but seeing with my eyes, it, it can't be a life change experience. Um, you might need to, to find out how to observe. You may need a manual. So the AGSO has all kinds of manuals for visual observing, DSLR observing, um, CCD observing. We have manuals for exoplanet observing. We have manuals for solar observing. The sun is a variable star. Safe solar observing. Is it mentioned in live? You might know, you might need to know where to look. So we're providing sky charts, which actually showcase where the star of your interest is. And not only that, which the comp where the comparison stars are and how bright they are. Remember the game that we played at the very beginning? That's all you're doing when it comes to detecting variable star observation. You compare the brightness of your object with everything else around it. That's it. You just need to know which stars are the comparison stars, right? And we're providing this information. Um, you might need to record your observations. So you need 
perhaps a piece of paper or a, an Excel spreadsheet. I usually scribble on my sky charts. Um, you might need a mentor. The ABSO has a really very active peer mentoring program. You know, different people learn different ways. So some people prefer to read the manual, some people prefer to just trial and error. For me, what worked was actually go outside with my mentor. I have two mentors, actually. Taking advantage of my organization's resources. Why not, right? Uh, so go outside and uh, sit right next to him with binoculars and try to figure out how to start home. It was extremely helpful. So maybe you would like to have a mentor. It would be great if you submit your data in the AVS or database. Remember what I said, every single data point matters. <coughs> so all you need is an observer code, just send us an email. We're going to assign the observer code to you. And from there, you need a clear night, and this is where I cannot help you, sorry. <laughs> so once you accumulate a number of data, um, the AVSO, and you reach milestones, the AVSO is going to give you a nice um, certificate celebrating that milestone and thanking you for your observations. I'm still working towards my 100 visual observations, which will happen this lifetime, I hope. So with that, now you know everything you need to know about variable stars. There's a quiz. Did you think it was free? So what kind of light curve is this? What kind of variable object is this? And I have, do I, do I want to be nice and give you a hint? It's it is not an eclipsing binary. It is not a pulse. It is not a nova. It is not a nova. All right. Time scales, minutes. Oh, okay, minutes. Wow. It's a neutron. It's not a neutron. Okay, it's a solar system object. Our solar system. It's not an asteroid. Mercury? It's a recent solar system object. Mm -hmm. so, oh, is it that object it's from interstellar space? Yeah, it's, it's, a it's not a satellite. Or more. The what? Or more. It's not. <laughs> okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Star uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What professional astronomers do? I mean, how far too much telescope time is in their hands? So, when Starman started his trip, lasting, maybe Bowie was it? Um, yeah, so one of my colleagues measured the rotational period of the car. It was moving like this, right? Reflecting sunlight. Uh, and he found that it was. 4.7589 plus or minus 0 0.0060 minutes. Pick <laughs> that. How was this? Let's go. <laughs> so I would like to leave you with some final thoughts. Um, this is my one of my favorite cartoons, Cal Calvin and Holmes. Calvin is far too smart for me. So um, he, they're looking up and they say, if people sat outside and looked at the uh, at the stars each, each night. I bet they live a lot differently. Something to think about. Astronomy gives us perspective. We live on this little rock, which is really significant, around a really boring star. We're going to live for 100 years. Right? But we're also smart to look out and ask the right questions and try to understand the world around us. And that's what matters. And we do that collectively. We do that all together. We do that as part of collaboration. This is what the AVSO is about. So with that, I would like to invite you to actually take a look at our webpage. You can find all the resources that I mentioned and even more here. Feel free to send us an email. Most of those emails come to me and I answer. And please, please, please become a member. How many of you are members? I've tried to join, but good. All right, I'm going to lock the door. <laughs> Entrance is free. Free exit is not. <laughs> Please become a member. We are a not-for-profit organization. Everything that we do, we do it with membership support. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and ask if you have any questions for me.
right, question. Yes. Does the ABSO uh, have a CubeSat working with Gibbs data? We do not have a CubeSat ourselves. We are working alongside CubeSat. So, so for example, we are part of a follow ground-based follow-up of the Bright collaboration. Bright is a, um, an international collaboration of five of those. We are looking at the brightest stars in the night sky. Think Beetlejuice, think um, apples to paint. Every, anything and everything that is brighter than itself. So uh, this is actually a really good synergy between our DSLR observers, our visual observers, and bright. CubeSats, oh my gosh, it's a, a completely different operation. So. Uh, how much, uh, obviously, you map most of the stars. Um, when you, you know, I, I tried to join, uh, I couldn't figure it out, but. Um, oh, we need to talk. But do you assign a section of sky, or do you just say, I want to look at this section, or I, are you looking at specific areas? We're looking at specific objects. We don't assign objects exactly because most of our observers have their own preferences. So we heard earlier the red light pulsating variables. I love things that explode. Uh, there, there's a, a big group of observers who have about 100 observers who observe the sun. It's actually a preference thing. However, we do have an observing tool that can help you plan your observations every night. You can actually register there and uh, it can show you which stars are available from your site, your observing site, and it will tell you which stars, um, which stars are in need of observations. Uh, we also have what we call alerts and campaigns. These are targets that are, are being requested for observations by some of our um, professional astronomy colleagues, and they, they need them as a, as a support of Hubble Space Telescope uh, <coughs> campaign, or Chandra campaign, or they have some, some big telescope time to do spectroscopy, and oh my gosh, this is a variable star, who knows what it's gonna do, we need light curves, something like that. The power of a network is that it can actually guarantee data. When somebody's telescope is clouded out, somebody else's is clear and observing. And we've seen it demonstrated non-stop in campaigns. So we are, we are a synergy between professional and amateur astronomers, and it becomes more and more clear. Um, for example, we have joined the, um, how many of you have heard about TESS? The new big thing in, in exoplanet observations. We are part of the ground-based support, uh, especially when it comes to target verification. And uh, because of that, um, our observers will actually, what they want is to make sure, because their pixel size is huge, they want to make sure that the transit or a blip in the light curve is a real exoplanet as opposed to an eclipsing binary with a bright star right next to it that kind of mimics the exoplanet transit. Uh, so what, what they want is observation of those candidates uh, from the ground. So they are they're trying to get as many non-professional astronomers to do that as possible. Now, here's the thing. What we want, what I want, is for every observer who takes data to participate in a, a publication, right? You're a colleague. You have to actually be part of a scientific paper. So we have a, a procedures manual that has a clause in there that once our observers participate in 10, I think, or 15 of those exoplanets, transit detections, or at least false positives, they report it then they're part of the publication, they're part of the paper. So again, we're building collaborations. The, the only difference, I guess, between you and me when it comes to astronomy is that I've, I've been on 30th grade when it comes to my astrophysics studies. I've been in school much longer, so. Well, I just figured out that I'm in grade 56. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It hurts, doesn't it? Try to, try to explain this to my six-year-old niece. She just looks at me. Yes. So Stella, with practice, mm. how precise, uh, how accurately can you gauge the magnitude visually uh, to within, you know, to a tenth of a magnitude? Because I know you have, you for every variable star, you have a field stars with comparison. Yes. So, so what's your typical accuracy? So if you trust me, don't trust me. Uh, if uh, there are some observers that we have that can uh, detect down to five percent. Which is extremely good, extremely good. Yeah. And actually, they can cover more than a hundred stars at night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just got to throw that in. 
experience. It's kind of tough at first. You know, you're not too sure about the estimates. That's why you get a mentor. Yeah. But I found it usually it's within about three tenths of magnitude. So the CCD people still, if you want something more specific, but for stars like uh, the Myra type stars, visual observers are right there. Three tenths of magnitude is pretty uh, pretty good. I can I can cover hours showing you showing you projects and light curves. And actually, my favorite. Um, I, my favorite projects, because they are of my interest, are of Norway, because they, they go really bright. And I have light curves of Norway showcasing that the visual data literally track the CCD data. Actually, the first detection of a shock in the Nova happened through visual data first, because it went so bright. Actually, I got an email at that time from an observer saying that, oh my gosh, the CCD is it's saturating. <laughs> like, okay, you have to wait until it goes fainter. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yes. The gamma ray burst. Yes. Happen about every other day. More or less. Once a day, maybe. What every other day? I don't have the rate. And they've been doing it since 1960 when they were first discovered. Correct. And uh, that seems like an awful lot of neutron stars out there. They're really far. It's a huge universe. <laughs> and there's a lot of time for the light to actually travel. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Really? Yeah, I get the uh, notice after people have looked at them. Mm -hmm at uh, for optical or radio uh, afterglow. Yes. After everybody has uh, looked at them, they send out an email and I get those I emails. <laughs> so that, that is a very variable star. It is a very, and a very fast one. We are trying to coordinate with the LIGO team, come with the gravitational wave team to see how we're going, because they want fast follow-up. Right. Um, and they know they don't have enough professional facilities to do that. They know we can do it for the brightest targets. We're trying to find a way of coordinating so that we can actually present projects like that to our observers. Try to detect gravitational waves, visual light curve after flows, and participate in that. What's the time Sometimes they burst just last for a few milliseconds, um, and then they disappear in a, an hour. But the thing is that light, uh, the, the gravitational wave detectors, LIGO and Virgo, has pretty much a huge uncertainty yeah, in space. Right. So we're talking about degrees. So how are you going to do it? I mean, our observers can observe a target if I say that star, right? But if I give you like degrees and I tell you you have several minutes, how are you going to do it? So this is where we're trying to figure out you know, I, I gave them parameters of what our observers can do. They know you guys can do it. Um, and they need to figure out their alert system and the detection system so that they can actually give us the right information. Does this make sense? So gear up, get a mentor, get a manual, <laughs> whatever you need. Right? Sir. For example, you spoke a lot about light curves of variable stars. How about spectra through mm -hmm. ABSO database? Did anyone ask you to ask? Nope. Oh. Ah. Yeah. Um, it's coming. Invite me again. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I think Sal will be here for a few minutes. Oh, yes, absolutely. And she'll be able to answer questions. Um, yes. I, well, let's move forward. I'd like to thank you for coming in tonight. It was awesome. for refreshments and I guess uh, the last thing I need to do tonight is to close out the 915th meeting of the ABSO. Happy holidays everybody. Happy ABSO. Happy ABSO. Uh, happy, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I invite you all to the 915 meeting of the ABSO. It's going to happen in three or four centuries but it's there. Alright, well thank you everyone and uh, happy holidays.